Hello and welcome to the Business of the Business Podcast. I am your co-host, JP John Paz from the Two Man Power Trip. Of course, joining me is the financial genius himself, the pro wrestling financial genius, Mr. Lavi Margolin. Lavi, how you doing today, sir? Hey, I'm doing well. Uh, for those that are listening on the podcast... Happy New Year uh, for those that are uh, experiencing this, possibly on YouTube, depending on when it drops. I hope that you have a good New Year uh, upcoming. Um, but either way, it's a, a time of uh, major and exciting change for the Business of the Business podcast on episode 162. Yes, a lot of changes going on here, uh, Lavi. Um, why don't you get into the first, um, I guess you could say change, if you will, a little, little update to the show. Yes. So, um, as we mentioned last week, um, we <coughs> transitioned from our, um, um, official business podcast, um, uh, banner. Um, we are now under, uh, PW Ponderings. We are the official business podcast of PW Ponderings. Um, it's actually uh, extra exciting for me uh, because PW Ponderings, uh, Chris and, and the whole team there, uh, they helped me get started um, in, in this crazy world, meaning that around 2015, maybe even a little bit earlier, I had seen a, a posting that uh, under the PW Ponderings umbrella, uh, I think it was ROH World, that uh, people could submit some articles to be considered for the website. And that had been something I had been thinking about um, that I wanted to write about wrestling, write about the wrestling business. I'd been thinking about it, but I didn't want to put it on like um, uh, message boards or something like that, which I wasn't sure who'd be reading it and what the response would be. I wanted to put it out in a more public forum. So that really gave me the opportunity, allowed me to gain confidence and and grow um, into, you know, one of the reasons that we're doing this here. Um, if you've never been to PW Ponderings, it's an awesome website to learn about independent wrestling, especially wrestling that isn't spotlighted as much as WWE and AEW really in line with how we do things. And some of the things that you should look for are um, the week in women's wrestling, wonderful coverage across the gamut of uh, that side of the industry. And something that's more timely, I know Luis Perez of uh, PW Pondering is out there uh, for a restival, and they're going to be having 11 events over just a few days. So we know that there's going to be coverage like no other. So check that all out. And uh, you used to write a bunch of different things for them, right? I mean, the, the woman's wrestling this week in women's wrestling. Is, is that true? Um, so that I had written about my focus um, was on Ring of Honor at the time. So the uh, the week in women's wrestling is something that I wanted to highlight that's currently on their website. Oh, OK, that, cool. Um, just in terms of um, something that's more evergreen as they cover so many results whenever you go there whenever you listen to this you'll see um some uh, amazing results that no one else has or no one yet has so rather than mention that because you know there's so many new results i wanted to highlight a couple of things that are um evergreen that uh, people should really uh, look for now let's get into some big time news here very interesting stuff we were able to finally meet in person uh we had some nice dinner and then we headed over to madison square garden and it was packed. What did you think about the WWE holiday show at Madison Square Garden? I know you had a little bit better seats than me, but still, I had some pretty good seats. Yeah, we did it, John. Um, interestingly, uh, we both uh, went in the same uh, the same section. You know, sometimes when I I've sat all over the garden, as, as you mentioned, you have too. And sometimes I like keep going up and up and up and up. But yep. oh, your yeah. seats, I believe, were in the one hundreds. Mine were on the floor. Um, I just be just because I don't happen to get the chance to go out as much. Um, when I do go, I like to do it up. So, um, I got section six, which was cool. Um, yeah, it was amazing to see the garden packed. One of the reasons that I really enjoy the holiday show is that you really get the casual fan and the families and you can really experience things through that, through their eyes. There was a guy, I don't think it was you, John, but somebody not too far from your section that was like, you know, sort of like an internet fan and was kind of like yelling out AEW sucks and whatever, kind of like B 
being annoying. Um, but, but for most people, like it was sort of like whatever the catchphrases were, whatever was being fed to them, and I mean this in a very positive way, whatever was yeah. being fed to them, they were eating it up and like ready to like celebrate the entrances, celebrate, you know, things, uh, things so much. Um, what do you think about the return of uh, CM Punk? That was great and got a huge pop, obviously loudest pop of the night by far. They were actually chanting for his name during a few of the matches beforehand. So he was definitely the most over guy, definitely the most popular guy. I noticed his merch, very hard to get, very scarce. I saw the return of Punk MSG shirt that was very rare to get, selling for upwards of $100 and more uh, on Facebook Marketplace and eBay and the such. So I guess anybody that was there and, you know, it has is – it's all for capitalism. They took the shirts away from some true group, you know, some fans that would really want it. And now they're selling it for hundreds of dollars on, on eBay. But that just shows you how uh, popular CM Punk is. I mean, Jesus, it's shirts, t-shirts from a house show. We're selling for a couple hundred bucks. It's like pretty crazy. Um, somebody was saying to me, cult like following. They kept saying cult like, this guy's got like a cult. It's a cult. I, it, it might be because man, they had 11,000 tickets sold last year. This year they figured out ah, 11, 12,000 we'll, we'll we'll sell it you know we'll set up for that amount and they kept expanding expanding opening up more seats opening more seats like okay official sellout is about 16,000 and we'll stop there and he sells out all the tickets so man and I like the match too and I liked his performance I thought it was good I love his the old school style a lot of the new school stuff where they don't have psychology they don't sell they don't try to draw heat I hate that kind of stuff so a lot of what he does is drawing heat. He's getting Rhea Ripley involved. He's getting Dominic Mysterio boot out of the building. He just was a master of psychology, if you will. So I really enjoyed Punker and his return. I just love the pop, too, because you never know sometimes the MSG crowd. Sometimes they could shockingly turn on you, but not not this crowd. They were they were great. Yeah, it was it was really um, fun to see. And I, you know, I had been um, a CM Punk fan for a long time from Ring of Honor. Um, I think I've told this story before on, on the show, but the first Ring of Honor show I went to was a bus trip run by Mike Johnson, now PW Insider. And um, when we pulled into the Rexplex before getting off, uh, we got um, a guest come on the bus, and it was CM Punk with the hand wraps and the X's, and there was a kid, um, I think he's Mittens now, it might have been someone else, but I think it's somebody known as Mittens, who was dressed as him, I was like, who's this guy, and who's this kid dressed as him, um, and I didn't realize till later, and then I saw the show, I was like, whoa, you know, that's amazing, so huge fan in Ring of Honor, um, love that run, like, sort of like his end run in WWE, then kind of like, yeah, I wouldn't say I was the biggest fan in AEW, but it was, it was a really cool thing to see. Some other things that I wanted to note um, was, you know, just in terms of, of course, how many the, you know, sometimes the sum of its parts doesn't equal sort of like the results. So I mentioned um, a few weeks ago, like with Impact, people back on a ma um, on a like promotional poster from 2015. And now you look at it and you're like, look at all these people that are like huge stars and some of them were then but like it looks even bigger today like um a drew mcintyre bobby lashley um la knight but it was different yeah. but in wwe now you see these like factions and alliances and they're actually making um the stars like bigger than they are individually you know of course you have the bloodline but you have like Rhea Ripley's, you know, group, you know, you have all these um, uh, different, uh, different groups that are really over um, and, um, you know, really filling out the card well. Now, one tag team, I know, like, I, I'm really looking at it with fresh eyes. Of course, you know, I'm familiar with them. I've seen their matches over the years and so on. But like, to me, <laughs> and I might be like overstating this, like, Chelsea Green and sorry, I, I shouldn't call her Dewdrop, right? What is uh, what Pepper uh, Nevin? Yes, uh, <laughs> Pepper Nevin's. Um, to me, they are like a huge, like, star team waiting to happen. Maybe they already were, and I like missed the boat or whatever, but like, just the way they complement one, one another. Like, I'm a big comic book guy, like, growing up, like, it seems like this like super villain team up where they're both so different but they complement each other so well and no shade to the champions. I'm just not familiar with them. 
they just just in that match they just didn't seem to have much whereas like Chelsea and Nivens like they were just like you know huge stars and Chelsea actually was the most over the match. They were cheering for her. They were cheering her name. They were actually booing, yaying when she was getting beaten up. <laughs> so she was getting over a, a, as a babyface there too. They they loved her. Even she even she wasn't doing anything babyface like. They just love her act. Uh, so I think she's a future star, probably even a single star for sure. But uh, going back to Punk for a second, highest grossing and got to mention this, highest grossing non you know, uh, televised event in WWE history. So the biggest house show moneymaker ever, the return of punk after 10 years to the garden, to the garden, Vinny, to the God. <laughs> I, I think, um, what would be interesting is if people, well, I think for pro wrestling would be actually very hard to do. Like sometimes you go back and you'll be like, okay, how many tickets did star Wars sell? And what were ticket prices in 1970, whatever. Um, and then you look at it like today and be like, what's really success? But pro wrestling was often thought about as like cheap entertainment. Like even in the mid nineties when Knicks and Rangers tickets weren't cheap, but WWF was cheap. Like it was like, right. The as would show like 12, 15 and $20 seats. $20 yep. was a great seat. So yep. even if you were to say that's $65 today, whatever it is still, you wouldn't catch up. So it's, it's being treated as uh, we, we talked about a little bit of um, funflation where entertainment has gotten much more expensive. So yeah. that's something to think about, but also to think about Madison square garden has gotten more expensive to book, right. And yep. WWE doesn't use it that much. So yep. I know that there's certain costs for television and pay-per-views. Um, so that might be a reason why, but like just generally they come through, Brooklyn a lot. They come through Newark, um, but not as much as the Garden. So when they're there, it has to be really impactful, and they have to charge for it. A couple other notes from me was the ages of the performers. Um, a lot of the top stars were in their late 30s, even into their mid-40s, which I have no issue with, especially being among the demographic. But yeah. It feels a little bit different. You know, I know WCW got slammed back in the day for that. To me, it's not about like the age. It's sort of like, can you go? But it's really indicative of how long it takes to pick a performer. I know, I believe Conan has, has talked about this. Like, right when I was in the locker room, it was men. You know, I think somebody, you know, we've, we've seen breakout stars in their late teens, even people in their early 20s, and each could be harnessed. But like, sometimes it is that maturation process and, and finding um, the right balance on this. And finally, and, and a very small thing to some people, but I think of note, you know, in the show, yes. when, when I got the um, reminder about going to the show in my email, it had the very bottom, the PBR, the professional bull riding, which we talked about last night. And a couple of times during the show, they put it on the screen that PBR was coming in, in January. And this is, Endeavor, right, which spun off TKO, TKO Endeavor Synergy. So a little thing, um, we'll curious to see if there'll be like more of a footprint. I don't think it would have gone over well if they like came out to interview a bull rider or something like that. I think, I don't think people would want to see a bull, you know, walk down the aisle or whatever, but um, interesting to see how they are utilizing that opportunity in a light way, which makes a lot of sense. Let's say, I don't think most people noticed it, but if you got, 400 people uh, to buy tickets because of that, then that's like a big win. Absolutely. I, I think it's funny, though, the PBR synergy stuff. People are like, the hell is this? Why is there so many commercials for bull riding and at, at MSG? But, hey, it, I guess it's popular in, in, in some demographic. But overall, though, I really enjoyed the house show. I enjoyed the bull rope match with Cody and Nakamura. The tag match with the Judgment Day and Uso and Sami Zayn was good. And Seth Rollins versus McIntyre was, was good as well. It was a good show overall. I was uh, pleasantly surprised with it. And Omos got a little bit of a reaction there, squashing our truth. Yeah, there, there's something to that giant thing, right? Walking through the uh, walking through the airport. I remember um, years ago um, when the wide fam, like I, I had a good seat then too. Not every time, but I had a good seat then too, where it was an aisle seat. And I remember like the wide family walking down. And I think this is Braun Strowman before he was like active much on television. He was more like accompanying them. And you just like look at him and it's like, 
whoa, you know, there, there's something about that. So even if there's a limited potential for an attraction, you never know when, when it clicks for somebody and it could be the biggest deal in the world, but there, there's something to that. Um, and that was like a fun little segment. And, and I will admit, like I texted you, John, like to me, Drew McIntyre, my mind, and I'm sorry for this. I know in no one else's mind anymore. Just three man band. I can't get past that. I even went to the Evolve shows where he really broke out, and yeah, and, me too. Yeah. And, and I had no issue with him there, and I enjoyed it. But like to me, like I can't see him as a main event, and I'm sorry for that. I know, I know, uh, I should get past that. Damn, I got a very important question for you though. Is cable TV still mainstream exposure now? So taking um, an article from our friend uh, Gavin Bridge, um, uh, the Fast Master, um, who was writing mostly focused on a very different topic in terms of our, is fa our Fast channels, hopefully, Gavin, I'm not misrepresenting this, but our Fast channels sort of taking away from cable television viewership. So I'm not looking to solve that today. But based on some of the data points that um, were that we shared, discussed last week, but not from us, um, about uh, television viewership, Gavin um, brought some interesting points aboard. Um, one of which was that there are very few, there are um, 62 cable networks that have an average of less than 150,000 viewers watching live in prime time. So, right, like when we think of pro wrestling, um, no, uh, pro wrestling viewership that's under 150,000, depending on the network, we often think about as quite low. So imagine that there's 62 cable networks of variety of different varieties and different types that um, that have low viewership. So when it's less than 150,000, is that mainstream, right? That's something to really think about. So between 1,000 and 49,000, the closer to 1,000, of course, is uh, BN Sports, which averaged 3,000 was 25 networks between 50 and 99,000, 22 networks. Um, and then um, growing, so that's 47. And then there's uh, doing some quick math about 15 more that are between 100 and uh, 150,000. Oh, I don't know if that's, uh, I don't know, like a sign of the times they're moving too fast or, or that they're moving to streaming, which is now getting commercials anyway. It's like, I wonder if uh, times are a change in here. Yeah, so th that was sort of my premise. And I, I didn't delve into the article as deeply as I, I wanted to yet from Gavin. So I don't want to like um, start dissecting a, a, a thesis, a theory uh, before knowing all the facts. But I think mm, it could. I, and one of the theories Gavin looked into in terms of like talking to some of these uh fast station owners or, or managers that they do some comparable ratings to these numbers in, in certain buckets. So that is one of the things, but I think there's so many different things, right? So many different ways to consume media and content, um, even social media um, that I don't think it's, I don't think there's a way to directly correlate to something like fast. I think fast is one of the ways that's shipping away cable TV, but I don't think that it's the main, uh, the main way. It's not affecting football. I'll tell you that much. Oof, my God, some of the range for these football games are nuts. But uh, as far as you know, maybe a little bit of fast or you know some of those channels, the Pluto channels, great streaming channel. They have uh, something maybe that surprised you a bit, right? Or or maybe they didn't. Maybe CW surprised surprised you. So I have to look into this a little bit more, but I know that Pluto had a special on WOW that was looking into Genie Boss's um, ownership, sort of like a behind-the-scenes thing as opposed to a pro wrestling show. Right. So more when it was quickly that. announced that, like, the morning of, <laughs> that the CW, meaning the network, not the app, of the CW would be having a WOW special and talking about the ownership and and so on of genie bus i assumed that it was the pluto special i have to look into that con to confirm that what was interesting about the special of not many interesting things about it from what i watched and i think viewers will will agree from the data that i have um, was that it was entertainment tonight presents wow so it was sort of wow. like a hmm. yeah it was a very um very light look like sort of like um 
maybe comparing like an in-depth novel or analysis to something that you'd pick up like while you're checking out the groceries at the supermarket. So yeah. it was closer to the to the latter. Um, like, hey, it's Billy Bush here. We're gonna look at Genie Bus and Wow. Yeah, one of those types. Exactly. Uh, hopefully, no hot mic or anything like that. Oh, but, yeah, uh, <laughs> but um, it, yeah, there was announced, and it was a one-off special. Um, so we have ratings. Um, first, it was interesting. It was like one of those weird things where one of these um, websites um, that covers it, they linked to Wednesday night. So I was, I was so excited. And then I clicked on the link and it showed the different shows, but the fields were empty. So uh, thankfully, Brandon Thurston to the rescue in the DMs, he told me, A, that uh, ratings look like they'll be delayed to the following day. So by the time you listen, you could probably find them. But I do have the fast nationals. Um, so... And again, I wouldn't make like too much of this, but we could like learn a little bit of lessons from it. From 8 to 8.30, 240,000 viewers. Um, adults, 18 to 49.04, number five, meaning number five of five, meaning of the five that they consider English language broadcast networks, it was five. Um, now... The story, though, is that once you get into 8.30, it was 0.14 million. So 140,000. So from 240,000 to 140,000. That's a pretty big attrition number. Yeah. So what does that mean ultimately? Perhaps not much, but what, one of the things that I would think about it is that if NXT isn't requiring exclusive on the CW. CW sees somewhat of a match of pro wrestling. We know that they've had a lot of dance partners and a lot of dating. Uh, the only one that they married thus far <laughs> you know, was NXT. But one can imagine WOW in some form sort of slipping into the CW in you know, of an hour a week if there's not exclusivity. So if this was a test to see like, well, what's the interest in WOW from the CW audience? Not much. Now, there was no, I don't know when this was acquired, if there was the chance to promote it at, at other points, but it just seeing the audience that tried it and said, no thanks, that's something there. But it's also not the WOW television show. It's sort of like, you know, sometimes WWE has those um, specials on Fox when it's like, uh, what was it, C CBS or whomever has um, has the NFL on, right? And there's like the the game that's going against it so they can't show something. So they have like a, a light special. So you can't really like judge judge it for much, but that's sort of what it indicates to me. But also um, uh, our friend Nick Hausman um, was, uh, was commenting a little bit when I was sharing some, some thoughts on this. So what I said was, this also makes a one-off type special about Billy Corgan's wedding featuring some NWA guys feel like a viable option on the CW. Nick said, I'm told it's a full season, meaning the, the NWA show, with just one episode about the wedding. It may be a running story through the show, though. Um, and I said, uh, perhaps it would be a quiet summer drop pre-NXT. And Nick said, maybe. Question mark. I really don't know what's going to happen with it anymore. I think it may just. So and then I said, um, I think it may just appear one day, which is kind of the history of non one or one a wrestling brands, meaning that like we barely had any time for this. It's, you know, a long time till I think October. Right. CW <laughs> doesn't mind picking stuff up and giving it a chance if they've already invested somewhat resources, time, or whatever it is in the NWA, and there's this pilot that includes, uh, or a season, a short season, that includes Billy Corgan getting married. Like, it might drop one day and then be there, and people might not notice it, and then it's gone. So I wouldn't completely close the door on the NWA. 
That is interesting because I was like, wow, Billy Corgan's wedding? Is that going to be a, like, yeah, like, they filmed it? What's going on there? So that's definitely something to keep an eye on. Also, another thing to keep an eye on, I don't know, Brandon Thurston, our buddy, always does a good job. What's going on with MLW and maybe a little bit of legal stuff going on? So the case is closed. Um, given the, the facts of this um, situation that uh, MLW, not that they – so it would be compelled to, but they cannot bring this case again. They cannot sue again, given the same facts. I think, you know, if WWE were to match with them in, in a few years, it doesn't foreclose them of, of being able to do it again. But meaning that, the, um, as Ben said, the judge signed the order today dismissing MLW versus WWE with prejudice, meaning the case can't be relitigated. This was basically a formality after WWE and MLW gave notice to the court on December 11th that they come to a settlement. MLW originally filed an antitrust. The court received and reviewed the party's stipulation for dismissal with prejudice. Based upon the stipulation, it is hereby ordered that the above captioned action and plaintiff MLW Media LLC's claims are hereby dismissed with prejudice with each party to bear its own costs and attorney fees. So, of course, the hanging question is, how much money <laughs> was exchanged? We don't know, um, as we talked about last time. We'll only learn one by what MLW does going forward, and they've been more active in the field uh, in terms of um, announcing shows, uh, which we may talk about in a moment, um, uh, uh, You know, booking uh, Matt Riddle, and so on. But what might give us some insight, and I don't know if they actually have to disclose the the actual fee, um, is when TKO reports if there's a, a re there would be a reference that the case was settled, but I don't know if necessarily they have to give a number and there might be some sort of confidentiality clause. Maybe some people can dissect the financials to sort of determine the number. So that'll be something curious next time there's the opportunity to file. So I'm um, looking at um, MLW's upcoming schedule. Um, no surprises from last week, but just to review um, on January 6th, they'll be back at 2300 Arena, as well as on um, February 3rd. On February 29th, um, there'll be uh, the show in New York at the Melrose Ballroom. Um, and March um, generally is their Blood and Thunder show. Um, Cage Match has it scheduled on the March twelfth, and on the fifth. So in May, sorry, in May on May eleventh, MLW Azteca Lucha Show at Cicero Stadium, one of my favorite places to um, watch MLW on television, especially when it was hot with Contra. Um, some of that. Uh, some of that action, um, they had announced that it was some of their fastest selling tickets in, in a number of years, which may be true, uh, but it didn't look like that many tickets you know, had been moved. How about New Japan Pro Wrestling? I was pretty shocked to see Hiroshi Tanahashi, his name pop up as far as being a president of the company. Is this true? Is he really the president? And what kind of impact may that have on uh, the, the United States? Yeah, he's really the president. Bushi Road is a public company. New Japan um, announced this on their website along with some other executive moves. So to dissect sort of what it means for New Japan business overall, maybe a little bit out of my purview. Um, you know, it seemed clear that they had been struggling in some ways. So change is good, but change hadn't been too far in the past. It's always interesting when an active star gets the book, so to say, or becomes the executive, maybe, um, and, you know, the two most applicable examples would be Triple H and Anoki, uh, yeah. right, uh, with New Japan, and Anoki for, you know, like, <laughs> and, and Baba, uh, of course, um, concurrently, and then ending, of course, um, before Anoki, um, that was quite successful. When it's done, where you know, where the, the public sort of knows who the you know who's the head, like Tanahashi again. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Like, right, he was still one of the main eventers. So, like, 
for him to get a title shot and win the title and celebrate that again if if you know that were to be in the cards it would be like a little bit awkward right like he's also in in the business suit so I'd assume, you know, he, I know that he's still going to be wrestling. I assume he'd be taking a little bit of a, a step back there. Hopefully, I don't think they do as like the hokey type of angles where it's like you're the um, you're the executive, you're holding me down or whatever sort of thing. Um, but I'm most curious in terms of their strategy moving forward internationally, especially in the U.S. and North America. Um, Tanahashi has been here a number of times. He even started doing, you know, smaller shows. So he has, you know, made some connections. Um, he's aware of the market. He's seen it, you know, at its peak in Madison Square Garden. He's also done shows, smaller shows, right, uh, in Philly, uh, in Queens. So curious to see um, how that uh, continues moving forward. And what his relationship is with uh, Rocky Romero, who's really um, been at the forefront of, of things here in America. And I'd imagine it's quite strong, um, but you know, that'll be apparent over the next uh, year, I would say 2024 will give us uh, greater insight into that, especially after the San Jose show to really see like what they do following that. To talk about Game Changer, one of our favorite promotions. What's going on with GC Dub? So, Game Changer Wrestling. So, to give uh, a picture of their upcoming shows, I was looking at um, some of their um, uh, ticket maps. Um, so, Atlantic City, December 30th and, and 31st. Um, Tickets, as far as I could tell, were moving actually very slowly. Sometimes you'll see that in Atlantic City. Less so, you know, sometimes in the winter months especially, but less so in these end-of-the-year shows. Um, as we're recording this, like a couple of days before they're set to take place, you could still get in the second or third row 10 or more seats. So that you know, is is not looking great. They've already scheduled their return to the show boat March 9th and 10th. As we talked about with Brett, like, right, the carousel room was a really special venue. It looked great on television. Now they're in the depot, which, you know, they've jazzed it up a little bit, but it's a bus depot. So it's not the same appeal. Um, Chicago with um, Thalia Hall or tell you all um is sold out so um i uh actually brett reminded me on, on twitter um we had a little bit of uh information sharing um there and um you know i would i had asked about um you know the tra trajectory um in terms of was it um ali that um, really led to this and he didn't attribute it specifically to that he said that there was just um uh 100 tickets left at the time um that some of the bigger names that were highlighted that he felt were helpful were andrade maki and cardona were already announced for the show but ali helped to uh to push it more across um the finish line um now in Columbus, Ohio, um, you know, uh, when a show is like a few weeks out for Ring of Honor, I don't like to specifically say slow, but looking slower, um, that there is 10 more seats in, uh, 10 or more seats in Columbus still. In uh, Tampa, um, let's see here. Tampa, I have, it looks like there are two dates. I just have a screenshot of one of them. That, that was moving fairly well for them for a show that's about a month out as we record this, a little bit less than that, that um, they had almost moved three rows deep and there was a fourth row um, that was available. Z Zulu, Zula Fatu, am I messing that up, John? Um, nope. Zillow uh, Fatu. So um, as he sort of gets out there a little bit more, that's... Um, Certainly uh, a unique attraction as the bloodline is, is on everyone's forefront. Ukrainian Culture Center, let's see. Um, that one is almost up to the third row. They've been doing really well there, so a little bit far out. Um, 
Arizona has been doing very well on, on February 4th. That was something Brent had attributed to um, some of their fastest moving seats in, in a while. Um, fourth row ringside, um, when I screenshot it, just had a few tickets left. So curious to see if there's enough space there to go um, five rows deep. Um, Jersey City, so that's the um, the J Cup. I wasn't following ticket sales trajectory there. Interestingly, in the summary, um, we know that they were coming to Dallas on February 23rd. I don't know if they specifically had announced the venue up before putting up this image. Gillies Nightclub. So um, that Gillies Dallas. So that had been, I don't know if they had been there specifically before, but we had seen different promoters use the that venue before. I think um, one was MLW. March 1st in St. Louis at Pops Nightclub. We talked with Brett um, a few weeks ago about how that might be one of the slower moving markets in terms of ticket sales, but establishing it and, and why it works um, with something like Trailer Plus. And as we mentioned, March 9th and 10th in Atlantic City. As far as the NWA is concerned, what is going on with them? What are some upcoming shows that are being brought to you by the National Wrestling Alliance? So interesting to see like some of some of the ways that it's being filled out as they have their um, alliances, some uh, more formal than others. But um, following the uh, Exodus Pro Colder Weather show in Cleveland that they did, um, in December. Now, on January 13th, they have a double shows uh, in Fort Lauderdale on the same day. So buy a ticket, come back, and so on, which is a hard sell. But NWA Paranoia, uh, which is a great title. And they're also teaming with uh, CCW Viva Revolution. Um, and then uh, the following day, so three shows in two days, the following day is their taping in Tampa and then working with the Exodus um, offshoot and the Exodus on January 27th. EC3 run and Exodus. Interesting. Obviously him being the champ. We'll see for how much longer, but as far as Triller is concerned, no longer fight, right? It's Triller TV powered by fight. What's going on with Triller? So as Triller sort of grows and expands in different verticals, including rugby and soccer and whatever else they're planning, um, using their social media and their platform to promote different things might be interesting, right? Like one of the things that they were highlighting was um, Circle Six, uh, which is a sort of a rival to GCW. Um, insane pain must be endured if you wish to become king and shows like all these death matches. So I had tweeted out, curious how often in the future an event of this nature will be spotlighted as Triller expands further into traditional sports. So I thought it was, you know, an interesting commentary. Surprisingly, Triller uh, liked the post. So I'm not sure if they were just happy that I shared it uh, because uh, it wasn't a critical post, but it was sort of a, a questioning post. Um, and then as we were going <laughs> yeah. uh, to air, um, All Japan um, just announced, a sh well, we know other show was around, but it was just announced that it would be on Triller that they'd have their December 31st show, uh, Nakajima defends the Triple Crown against K Kento Miyahara. So, um, and I think people were speculating, right, as, as NXT talent is planning to migrate there people were like oh okay maybe that's why they only did one show or trailer so clearly like that was too much looking into uh things too much with the wwe relationship and look they're they're back to doing another show or trailer now as far as ovw is concerned they got a big show coming up i think big foley's even on the show what's going on with ovw right now history will be made january 6th at nightmare rumble we are sold out Every show at the Davis Arena seems like a sellout, which is great since their yep. um, announcement, uh, you know, not their announcement, but the Netflix uh, wrestlers show. We're sold out. So you can catch all the actions to pre-order the pay-per-view through OV Wrestling. So the way that it was announced, it made me curious because we know that, I mean, their show is distributed a number of different ways, but Triller is one of the ways that they distribute their show 
I believe, for free um, to not show a plus but thriller. So I'd imagine that maybe, you know, an iPay-per-view or something like that. But no, this is a stream that they're um, – that you, you buy it, like you buy a ticket, and then they'll send you a private link um, that's meant just for you. So – Interestingly, on this page, and I'm not saying it necessarily equates to sales, um, but this is what came up when I went to the page. So it said, 12 people reserved tickets in the last seven days. So this page was just for buying the pay-per-view. So I can suppose, and people can correct me, that 12 people purchased this in the last seven days. Interesting. I wonder if I wonder how accurate th that is. But yeah, it's it's all sold out. So where was it streaming? It's only streaming via like the website, though. It won't be on um, Fight. I, yeah, I don't know if there's other plans, but the way they're promoting this link, and then when you go to the website, it looks like you just you just buy this link and and apparently 12 people bought it in the 7 days since i was there i mean people i'd imagine the most time people would buy it would be the day of so i'm curious of going that day and getting hopefully x amount of x multiple amount of people have bought it but you know i don't know how many ovw fans are willing to put forth the money to a pay per view right you can watch the netflix show and or go live or watch, you know, their wide TV distribution and say, I enjoyed that. I'm full, but am I motivated to buy a pay-per-view? I think it's certainly worth trying and maximizing it. And they can use this content in other ways. Um, but I don't, you know, it's, it's hard to tell what's like, um, what's a pay-per-view, what's like a good buy rate for a promotion like OVW Wrestling. Yeah, now it says 14. I just checked. It just said 14. But if you're going to, to me, anyway, if you're going to order the show, which is 20 bucks, and you get, the, you get the stream and you get the private link sent to you, I'm going to order it that day. I'm not ordering it two weeks, <clears throat> excuse me, two weeks ahead of time. You know what I mean? So I wouldn't yeah. expect more than a, 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 not to say that maybe it's not going to be as popular or whatever, but I just wouldn't expect a lot of people order ahead of time. When I order my pay-per-views, I literally, it's that day. Yeah, John, I think you have to send me a Google Calendar invite January 6th. Let's click yes. on the link and we'll, yes. we'll get a screenshot. But uh, but I yes. love like data. So hopefully, like as we announce this here, hopefully they're not like, oh, whoever's running their webmaster. Oh, I screwed up. Why why are we telling people that? But I'd love for right. this to remain on, on the website. Yes. Um, R O. W reality of wrestling. What is going on with Booker T's promotion and even some NXT crossover? Yeah, so Booker T, as we've talked about before, he sort of has a um, a unique relationship with WWE. Maybe maybe too much to say, sort of like a, a Jerry Lawler running Memphis promotion where you can sort of like pull talent over and it's like not a big deal or whatever. But like especially talents that come out of his um, his school um and others that he can then utilize uh on show so for a forthcoming show he has additional seating added we just had additional seating for our next big event on saturday january 13th since our original seating setup sold out so quickly um i do apologize i know that it's a a notable talent i believe from nxt that's coming back over that he trained um john not to put you on the spot do you do you know offhand who that is or, or recognize them from the poster? Uh, Roxanne Perez. Okay, great. Thank you. I, I meant to put it in my notes, but uh, the great, that... The great Roxanne Perez, yes. Yes. So, And no offense to Roxanne. Everyone knows that I'm a little bit bad with names. You you are terrible with names. But she <laughs> she is very good on NXT. Obviously, she's one of the probably maybe the top girl in NXT. So uh, it's your top female wrestler. So Pretty uh, pretty good get by Booker T. Yeah, and, and not to railroad us into a different discussion, but until probably to me, and, and again, obviously the very casual viewer, prior to the bloodline, I feel like the, the women were like killing it in WWE at all levels. Like their, um, their feuds and their matches and um, Becky Lynch and, and so on at the time, um, it was just so much more engaging. 
than whatever they were doing with, with the men's division. I think the men has, have caught up now and maybe, like, you know, it, it just depends on like the storyline and so on. And um, uh, Rhea Ripley obviously is, is a top star now with the women, but like, I think that for, for a number of years, like the, the women were really more engaging and, and carrying things. Now it's good to see like on both sides. Let's talk about Harley Races, World League Wrestling, and what is WON? Because I know it's not uh, has anything to do with Dave Meltzer. I mean, what's what's going on here? What is this WON? Yeah, that's what I um, <laughs> I uh, sent um, our friend Matt Ryan at Catalyst Wrestling when he announced that Catalyst was going to be on WON. I was like, what's WON? <laughs> uh, and then like I fell into this wonderful rabbit hole of WON, which is quietly as they grow, um, has been distributing a number of different wrestling properties, some just on its own platforms and websites. But most interestingly to me at the moment is through various New York City public access channels. First, I thought they were only doing it for Catalyst Wrestling. And then when I looked, I saw Harley Race's World League Wrestling. And I was like, that's awesome. Like uh, WLW is on TV in New York. And um, I recorded uh, the episode, obviously, when we were both out at uh, the Garden on a Tuesday night, um, and Matt Seidel was on TV. So uh, it was fun to see, and I'd, I'd love to talk to, I believe, Leland Race sometime on the show. Just um, They have a really good, you know, relatively distribution network of WLW, and they're doing some interesting things, but also... WON, curious to see how they continue to grow as they're building different relationships in, in pro wrestling and distributing some content farther and wider than uh, than you would expect. What is going on with TNA? TNA. What's going on with TNA wrestling? So just circling back to uh, what's ahead without anything necessarily breaking big this week. Of course, we know on January 13th and 14th, they'll be in Vegas, um, Hard to Kill, and then Snake Eyes. Um, just, I would say, a few hundred or maybe several hundred, sound more positive, uh, tickets moved for those shows. Then um, they'll be in the Orlando area on January 19th and 20th for Impact Tapings. And then the New Orleans area, but more specifically, West Wego, or West Wego Louisiana, on February 23rd and 24th. So nothing yet to the rumors that um, they were going to start uh, booking big venues. <laughs> Please, you know, uh, chill. Like, let's let's do it one step at a time. Although I said that to Cody Rhodes before. Uh, I mean, I said it, but I tweeted it to Cody Rhodes before uh, All Out, and I was wrong about that. But, you know, take it one step at a time. Uh, we'll, thematically, we'll get into a little bit of AEW. Uh, in a moment, but um, right, walk before you run or whatever it is. But who is going to be this big, uh, this big announcement? So again, I'm I'm feeling like uh, Matt Riddle. Uh, what do you think, John? I was thinking the same exact thing, but you know we've said this before. Never say that because it never reaches the expectations. Remember, AEW was saying they had this huge announcement, huge announcement, and it ended up being Christian. And he's great, and, and everybody loves him, but it's like, okay, that fell flat just because, like, you can never, like, unless Hogan is coming out of his prime or, you know, you got Steve Austin's prime coming back, you're never going to reach that expectation that you're throwing out there. Never do that. I would say the only way to exceed that, perhaps, and I would say this would be for, like, a couple of matches just because she's so close to Trinity but like Mercedes Monet, like just having yeah, that would create you know, a buzz. Yeah. Yeah. Like she's just, just having fun. Come out, challenge Trinity for the bell. Maybe she wins it. Then Trinity wins it back. And then Trinity's even in, in a higher profile position than she was before, just to like help out her friend. Like sort of like a, a Moxley type of thing where uh, Moxley's in that position. He can go where he wants. But Monet also has to be. I wouldn't say careful because ultimately if she comes back to WWE, nothing that she does is going to like hurt her when she's doing it in lower profile settings. Um, but sort of like not to like overexpose, keep things special. You don't want it to be like, I was here, I was there, I was, you know, everywhere. 
and now I'm I'm back with WWE or I'm with AEW. You want to like take each thing and make it special, but a two match series with Trinity, I think, would get a lot of attention. Um, would get buzz for her, not that she needs that much, but ultimately help her friend a lot. What is up with the Hamburg Fieldhouse? Is it going away? What's going on? So. Uh, a few weeks ago, we were uh, unfortunately ready to say goodbye, but it looks like, you know, that Undertaker meme, like the, the hand from, I think I'm missing the camera, the hand from the grave or whatever it yes. is. People get what I'm saying. Yep. <laughs> but um, the Reading Evil Eagle said a deal for a union fire company to lease the Hamburg Fieldhouse to a local car dealership has fallen through. The arrangement would have put an end to events at the facility. So, it's not over yet, um, depending on who it's leased to and whatever deal can be worked out. Um, pro wrestling may continue at the Hamburg. I, I hate to see old WWF venues like that um, go away, um, and, and hopefully it, it can. this match can continue. So as far as AEW is concerned, even more – Management changes are going on. Even more originals are gone from the company. My longtime close personal friend, Raphael Morphy, tell me about him, his position, what's going on with him and AEW. Yeah, so uh, factually, what we know is that he held the position of vice president of live events and touring since the formation of AEW and was responsible for setting up live event tours, booking buildings, local marketing, and other logistical responsibilities. When it came uh, to the actual booking and running of live event of uh, aspect of AEW, or as it's been reported, is departing the company um, to uh, take uh, what's been described as his dream job with Barclays in Brooklyn. Um, why not? It, it probably is. It's local to him. He's yeah. from the area. It seems like a great position. So, on. However, um, one thing that I do want to note was that in his role with AEW, he was put in a very, very difficult position, meaning that, you know, when, when you're in charge of live events, it means that, like, you should be able to get some of the glory, even when the company is very hot, but you also shouldn't get a lot of the blame when the company is cold. But you are in the responsibility of booking venues and it's up to you, you know, your boss who may be directing you how and when to book them. There seems to be a stubbornness to give up on booking um, top notch 20,000 seat or thereabouts indoor venues often referred to as NBA size or NBA type arenas. Um, when you know you can't book, you cannot sell them out even if you're scaling it down to a third. And the fact that AW, right, I'm like standing at soapbox, but the fact that AW is still doing that is an embarrassment. It's a waste of money and it's ridiculous. It makes them look, you know, like Jim Gordon, like at a, at a Waffle House, or, uh, it, you know, it makes them look like, uh, you know, not the 1A, but like really um, the people that are don't care about money and maybe, you know, I think not that they don't care about it, but they have more money to play with and they don't have to be as careful. Um, and, but why? Like why it's, you know, not everything you try is going to be a hit, but like why book Newark, the same market in New York City? I know some people that go to Long Island aren't going to go to Newark and vice versa. There are like areas outside, but like the core of that market who are coming from World's End which is has grown its number to almost 9,000 people, probably 9,000 or, or thereabouts um, by the time the show comes, to Newark where you're going to get 3,500 people or 4,000 people when you can book a venue uh, that's, you know, 7,000 people, that, you know, and scale it down to 4,500 or 5,000. But so, like, to be in that position, um when it's not a pay-per-view or it's not a, a debut in a hot market, it just, it hurts your reputation and, and it is a smart move to get out. And I wouldn't be surprised if that didn't factor in. The second is uh, yep. Dana Massey, right? um, who was, uh, was she a vice president as well? 
or just just uh you have uh, merchandising or more merch than, yeah okay so the, the difficult thing and not to say she wasn't deserving of the role she's obviously done it for a number of years and there's been some really cool merchandise and things sold and, and so on so it's not like any of that should be taken away from her uh, we don't know the reason why. It seems like a very stressful position. We know that there was a uh, uh, a sting snow globe that a photo that came out that it has the same hairline as me at the, at the moment, which is I know Sting is you know an older person, but it just looked it it was kind of a little bit embarrassing um, to see. So, but it also speaks to sort of like the cracks that are going on in the company, and I don't want to like sound bleak like I'm writing for Forbes or something about AEW, but but it is curious from like a business perspective, like what's going on? Uh, we know that there was a you know, high level production person that left recently. We know um, some of these top talents have been leaving recently. So it's just curious. We we know the deal with Warner Brothers Discovery is is not confirmed for a number of years moving forward. So it's just something curious to see. Again, I'm not, uh, you know, whenever you say something, I'm not a WWE mark. Uh, I don't hate Impact. You know, I want to see AEW succeed. Um, but it is it is things where they do need to tighten things up. As we talked about, John, right, they're looking for a head of HR, and, and they need, yep. you know, some of those issues worked out. So I might have missed the narrative, but that was my, <laughs> my soapbox. Yeah, a lot of changes. QT Marshall quit as well. So I mean, a lot of changes behind the scenes uh, with AEW for sure. But let's wrap this bad boy up and hit the plugs. Follow me on Twitter and Instagram at 2 Man Power Trip. Lobby, what do you got going on? So firstly, check out um, uh, pwponderings.com. See the rest of the coverage. Check out this week in women's wrestling and all the massive um event coverage especially our friend luis perez who uh who uh contributes a lot of that but uh, for myself on twitter lovey mark l-a-v-i-e-m-a-r-g check out my long form articles on lioncubjobsearch.com and check out uh our linkedin group the business of the business which now includes um job listings i recently shared a wrestling writer uh, job as as well. So for a website, not for a, a promotion, but we have uh, had promotional job listings as well. So when I see them, I share them. Nice. Awesome stuff, Lavi. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. See you right back here next week for a little business of the business. We'll see you next week, folks. <laughs>